So why I care about string theory? A theory, supposedly of physics, that has no experimental support so far. Brian Green explains why in this beautiful book, Fabric of the Cosmos. Joe Conlon has a very nice, less popular, a little more technical book, Why String Theory, where I stole this title. Joe Polchinski has a string theory book that's a textbook, but it does have some general discussions that I think are very useful. The objective of this video is not really to learn about string theory, but to find at least one non-textbook technical reference you want to read and learn whether you want to be interested in string theory or not. The textbook answer to why string theory is it contains classical gravity, quantum gravity, grand unification, extra dimensions. These ideas have showed up in other contexts. Supersymmetry, chiral gauge couplings like in the Stana model, left hand and right hand particles at different gauge representations. No free parameters and is the theory unique? Classical gravity and the Stana model are clearly important, experimentally well established topics, so if string theory helps to understand them, that could be interesting. The other ones are new ideas about the future. The popular answer was given by Conlon in his book. It could be that the correct theory of quantum gravity has nothing interesting to say about mathematics is disconnected from the Stata model, tells us nothing new about quantum field theory, and offers no additional insights into theories of classical gravity. However, to many it seems unlikely, and this feeling explains why string theory is so wildly viewed as the best candidate idea here. This long quote, I think, says it all. You might say that the guy recording this video is clearly biased in favor of string theory. I made it clear for you in my thesis that I didn't write about string theory. I like string theory, and I want to tell you now why I like it. But I will mostly quote smart people who have said they like it for other reasons. Let me start here. Gravitational waves were recently detected, according to LIGO collaboration, from a binary black hole merger. Of course, this sounds extremely exciting, if it's true. But one interesting feature of this discovery paper, that you can look up yourself, is that until the Chapel Hill conference in 57, there was debate whether they exist. This conference was organized by my supervisor, Cecil DeWitt, who unfortunately passed away the week I'm recording this video. And at this conference, Richard Feynman described what is called the sticky beat argument that has a Wikipedia page. This is a very interesting story in itself, and I will come back to this in other videos. Cecil and her husband Bryce DeWitt moved from Princeton to Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the 1950s to establish a new research institute, privately funded. They hosted that conference mentioned in the LIGO article. Incidentally, Peter Higgs came there in 65 and wrote one of his big Higgs papers there. And the DeWitts later moved to UT Austin. This is beautifully described in the biography of Bryce DeWitt. In 1963, I gave a student of mine the problem of computing the cross-section for graviton, graviton scattering. Graviton would be the quantum carrying the gravitational wave, just like the photon is the quantum carrying the electromagnetic wave. The relevant Feynman diagrams would be these. They lead to over 500 terms, but the final result is very simple. In string theory, there's only one diagram. Its contribution is relatively easy to compute. String theory is much better than he originally thought. Just incidentally, when we think about things like graviton scattering that doesn't seem to have a lot of application, I do think it's good to always keep in mind the connection between basic and applied research. For example, Bethe's work on fusion, how the sun shines, his paper Energy Production in Stars, one can say is directly connected to the attempts to build a fusion plant in France uh, that's currently underway. Please look at this site if you're interested. This just reminds us that things that are seem very abstract and distant can be related to things that are potentially of benefit to society. Quantum gravity in the 2000s, so you can take Bryce DeWitt's drawing here of a string diagram. You put non-perturbed states as external states, like Dirichlet brains, that I will talk about in a later video. Loop diagrams and string theory are then the lowest order interaction between these non-perturbed objects. However, many things remain unclear. Loops with less than maximal supersymmetry, non-trivial backgrounds, and many other things. Still, there was progress. This very interesting relation between a string theory paper from 1986 called KLT that led to progress on the idea that maybe gravity is the square of gauge theory, as is sometimes stated. In fact, for recent topics, when teaching string theory, I propose some student projects that you can yourself evaluate whether you think string theory made useful contributions to any of these 26 fields. Some of them might seem surprising to you, like philosophy or computer science. For this last one, just look this up. Um, I will just do a couple of quick summaries of a couple of these, if you're interested, but you can easily find references about this yourself by quick Googling. String theory and superparticles. Supersymmetry was discovered in string theory in 1971. The maximally supersymmetric quantum field theory with Lagrangian here, was discovered in string theory, as summarized beautifully here by Lars Brink. Supersymmetry has not been discovered, however. Notice a different use of discovered in these three sentences. But I think it's fair to say that supersymmetry gives useful models for theorists, whether or not it is directly relevant to current particle physics, as explained, for example, in this paper. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. I won't go through all these projects, but, but let's consider 
cosmology other, by that I mean, for example, inflation. So these fellows describe inflation in this book very nicely. They put it on the archive also. They explain why inflation is important. And these people actually try to match some of the models discussed in this book to data. So this is one example that string theory could be relevant to physics with experimental implications, but it's very far from saying that that's the case yet. How about string terminology? Is that an oxymoron? as Fernando Quevedo asks here. He says the string theory actually makes many predictions, especially at or close to the string scale. Clouseau Klein Tower states, massive string states with specific behavior under high energy scattering, etc., which should be the natural case for theory of quantum gravity. Some string scenarios have many other potential implications at much lower energies, which is encouraging. I should emphasize that some people like Neymar Khani Ahmed seem to occasionally disagree with these statements here. How about the Hawking radiation information paradox? The entropy of a black hole given by the Bekenstein Hawking formula can be computed from state counting in string theory. This works mainly for supersymmetric black holes to get the right coefficient, and this is explained in textbooks. The resolution of the information paradox is more unclear. Hawking gave up his bet with Preskill, if you know about that, due to anti deciter conformal field theory duality, also known as holography. This is a wonderful topic, in my opinion, that is well described by these people here. A lot of the topics in my project list have to do with ADCFT. I won't talk more about it here, but if you're interested, please take a look here. Algebraic CFT, by that I mean sum of quantum field theory with conformal symmetry was actually discovered in string theory, as reviewed in this book. Some people think that mathematically well-defined quantum field theory might come ultimately from conformal field theory, as described on this Wikipedia page, which is largely about mathematics. I might say in string theory you get usually supersymmetric theories, but as argued by Douglas, a solution to the problem in a sufficiently general class of supersymmetric theories would in fact imply the solution of the original problem. And he's talking about the Yang Mills Millennium Prize problem to define Yang Mills theory mathematically. So maybe string theory could help with this kind of discussion. In a similar vein, path integrals or functional integrals versus operator formalism, canonical quantization. These two descriptions of quantum theory are both, you know, useful and valid. Many people in physics think that it was invented strictly in physics, but actually Norbert Wiener published this article in 1923, as described by Cartier and DeWitt Moret in this book. So this is an interesting topic that maybe string theory can add something to. In Polchinski's textbook, for example, he has a short course on path integrals, where he argues, one may cut the world sheet surface open along many different closed curves. Different choices give a different representation of going from here to here. So this is an interesting question in string theory. Another interesting question for scattering amplitudes is also the existence of dualities. We will not discuss ultraviolet issues in this paper, since there are none. Strength here in philosophy. Most of us are not philosophers, but this is an interesting little project. Read some of these references and try to understand what they're saying. This paper says, string theory has been playing the role of a well-established approach towards the universal theory of all interactions for over three decades and is trusted to a high degree by many of its exponents in the absence of either empirical confirmation or even a full understanding of what the theory amounts to. Weimer says, it may certainly not be confirmed by mathematical reasoning, which is precisely what is discussed here. So again, I'm not an expert, but this, me, these are pretty interesting questions. Like most physicists, I feel pretty comfortable with this statement. Another interesting topic in mathematical quantum field theory is discussed in Weinberg's textbook. He writes, by Feynman, Fade, and Popham, and DeWitt, they were figuring out how to compute loop amplitudes involving gluons, or generally gauge bosons, and they have these funny ghost fields going in this loop. This is a warming up exercise for the harder problem of quantizing general relativity, there was progress made on physically relevant theories. And this will come back in a later video. Let me finish by mentioning a few aspects of the rich connection between string theory and mathematics. So there's a beautiful cover by Dijkreff of this book, where I stole this kind of idea. First is in 1968, maybe early 70s, let's say, people were celebrating Feynman diagrams, everything was making sense. Mathematicians were celebrating index theorem, things like that, things were making sense. And if you fast forward 30 years, you notice that we're considering each other's topics. But we feel a little confused. Dijkreff's cover is much funnier than mine. This book was from this time. What is happening now? The three loop amplitude in string theory was first computed in a few years ago. Uh, the six point amplitude was very well understood in this paper. But I would say there's still a lot of interesting questions about scattering amplitudes in recent work. And one example is Moonshine Beyond the Monster by Terry Gannon, a mathematician. And this is nicely reviewed by Shamit Kahu, a physicist, that the conformal field theory on the K3 service, you can compute this quantity. The numbers you get here as 
coefficients, 90, 462, and so on, have significance as the dimensions or representations of a sporadic group, which is interesting to mathematicians. There are also new formulations. This is also work in progress. The old formulations, I mean Green Schwartz or Ramon Green Schwartz formulations, that are written in textbooks, but newer formalism from 2000 is a pure spinner formalism. Space-time supersymmetry is manifest. You can compute loop amplitudes and define a BRC operator that I mentioned earlier in terms of a pure spinner and this uh, object that gives a space-time supersymmetry derivative. So you should decide for yourself in this paper and as follow-up, you can see some of my motivations why I think string theory is exciting. So classical string theory. Here are some references. I mostly follow Polchinski. If you need motivations, you can uh, watch the video or you can check out this book. You won't learn string theory from watching a few videos. That's clear. These videos can be useful as a quick overview when you're studying, either by yourself or a class, or as a quick review after having taken a course to prepare for a more advanced course. Let's consider a point particle moving in space, so it forms a trajectory in space-time. It moves along, and we parameterize the position along this world line by tau. Clearly, if it was in flat space with no external forces, it would just go in a straight line, but here we imagine that there could be some external field, for example, gravitational field, that makes it move a little funny. This could be described in the world line formalism, you may be not so familiar with, as an embedding. You have an embedding from the world line, tau, to space-time. And it's written by capital X to distinguish it from the pre-existing space-time coordinates, little x mu. So this is capital X mu, is the embedding function from the world line to space-time. The point particle action in the world line formalism is given by minus the mass of the particle times the integral of the space-time interval. This is, uh, should be fairly familiar to you in that this interval is expressible as d tau times square root of this uh, uh, contraction. Uh, you can exchange this tau here that differs from this tau by a Lorentz factor and you get this kind of uh, expression. This is the first exercise in Polchinski chapter 1. So you can expand this for small, small velocities and you recognize the usual kinetic term for a point particle minus the energy mc squared. Of course c we set to 1. If you're not familiar with these units, go back and review it in the uh, Zwiebach's book. is very well explained there. What is really nice about this is if you vary this original action that is very, very compact in a curved background, you get the geodesic equation of general relativity. And this is nicely reviewed on this Wikipedia page as a reminder. So this is a powerful way to talk about actions in uh, of a point particle moving in a possibly non-trivial background. What about a string? So if you had a string with two endpoints, an open string, it can move in space-time and its ends describe uh, world lines and together they describe a world sheet. So now we have two variables, sigma and tau, and we have an embedding of the world sheet from sigma tau to space-time, much like the point particle embedding, but now it depends on two coordinates, sigma and tau. You might have wondered already in the point particle case this is discussed in footnote 3 and 4 in Polchinski, chapter 1. The first is about the global issue. An immersion means that it doesn't double back on itself. And an immersion is differentiable, so this turns out to be not much of a problem. If you're interested in this, go and read this chapter. Uh, it is a very interesting topic. The formation of cusps on, for example, closed strings when a left moving and a right moving wave hit each other. You take these two coordinates, tau and sigma. A goes from 1 to 2, or 0 and 1 in this case and uh, you form an induced metric. So you differentiate the embedding function x mu with respect to these two variables, giving you a 2 by 2 matrix, 2 by 2 metric on this world sheet. You should be familiar with the idea that the square root of the minus determinant of the metric integrated over a volume is the volume form. Here is an area because it's in two dimensions. We have a funny factor up front which is minus the tension and alpha prime here is known as the uh, slope for historical reasons, but it has units of area. So this whole thing is dimensionless because we set h bar to 1, so we want the action to be dimensionless. And then the tension should be units of 1 over length squared, which is energy by length, if you think about it. So this action has d-dimensional Poincaré symmetry, the usual Lorentz transformation plus a possible shift. It's obvious because the indices are contracted here. So right now we imagine that this moves in a flat background, but we will later generalize this to a curved background, as I was hinting at on the previous slide. So this is the two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry, that you can change coordinates on the world sheet. Tau and sigma could go to tau prime and sigma prime. This is an invariance of this action. 
This is manifest here because this is an area, and the area doesn't change under relabeling of coordinates. Here's an open string. If you put it, for example, in a imagine a point particle in a magnetic field, it will rotate in space. In space time, it will form a helix string. It goes in a circle. It forms a it forms a shape called a helicoid, minimal surface. That means that given the boundary condition out here of the open string endpoint, you can compute that the minimal area given this boundary condition is this minimal surface. This kind of classical string theory is discussed at length in Zwieback's book. It is not much discussed in Polchinski, but it's a good thing to think about initially. And in fact, it does generalize to a lot of other interesting calculations in string theory. Well, the Plateau's laws tell you about minimal surfaces formed by soap, which is one of the original ideas of minimal area surfaces in mathematics. For example, Plateau observed empirically that the angle between these three vertices is 120 degrees and these four vertices is 109 degrees. There have been attempts to use this in physics many times. For example, imagine a, an electron as a spherical membrane that has electrostatic repulsion of itself, but it has tension, so it wants to pull itself together, and they can wobble and oscillate. Dirac actually considered this in 1962. There's a Wikipedia page on this if you're interested. He viewed the muon as the first excitation of this spherical membrane, so wobbling like this. That turned out to have mass 53 electron masses, which is not quite right, but it's a very interesting uh, model to study. In string theory, this has, this has reappeared as the Dirac Born Infill action, which we'll talk about later. Another way to think minimal surfaces in, uh, in string theory is the Malusena Wilson loop. This has to do with the Wilson loop that you might remember from quantum field theory. If not, you can look it up. Imagine putting this in a gravitational field. So you have a surface that can be formed with this boundary condition, but there's a gravity pulling it down. So the surface will look something like this. And depends, depending on the metric in this curved space, you will get different shapes. For a more interesting perimeter than this circle, you might get something like this with a triangle. You get this minimal surface, where it's upside down. This is hard to draw when it hangs down. And you can change the perimeter like this. And this is a nice paper about this here, if you're interested. And there's a trick. Polchinski discussed it also for the point particle. Here I will only discuss it for the string. Let's introduce a two-dimensional world sheet metric. We call it gamma. It's distinct from the induced metric little h that we had before, which is this object. This is a new object. It did not exist in the Nambu Goto action. And forming this is called the Polyakov action, even though Polyakov didn't really invent it, as discussed in Polchinski. To show their equivalent, you introduce these three new functions. This is a symmetric two by two matrix. You can compute the equation of motion for this metric gamma. It looks very much like the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action in general relativity to get Einstein's equation. You take the variation. This one is obvious. You vary the metric here. You get this thing. But you also need to vary the determinant. And you use something called Jacobi's formula from linear algebra. This what you know from general relativity, how you vary a determinant. You multiply it out. And then you relabel indices CD to AB. So you can combine these two terms nicely into this combination. So you see that the equation motion for gamma, this is a constraint on gamma. You introduce a redundancy of three functions, now you put three conditions. Doing that, you can actually solve this matrix equation. You observe that this is kind of a trace. So taking the determinant of this matrix equation, you can solve for the trace and plug it back in, and you get this equation. You plug that back into the Polyakov action, and it reduces very quickly to the number goat action that we had to start with, because these two determinants cancel, and this is just a constant trace that gives you the right normalization we had before. So the Polyakov action will be the main object of study. It has d-dimensional Poincaré symmetry, just like Namagoto, under which x transforms and little gamma is invariant. It has two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry, meaning symmetry under change of coordinate on the world sheet, under which x is a scalar, and gamma transforms as a two-tensor, as befits a metric on the world sheet. But now we have an additional funny symmetry called while invariance under which x is invariant, but little gamma transforms with a rescaling. It's an overall rescaling, so it has no matrix structure, but it depends possibly on the coordinate sigma. So these are the symmetries of the Polyakov action. Sometimes diffeomorphism is shortened to diff. Now where did this two-dimensional while invariance come from? Different world sheet metrics give the same induced metric. That's the reason. So Namagoto had no gamma. If you change gamma, it doesn't notice. So this is entirely new symmetry that came from introducing this new worksheet metric. You have a symmetry, you want to use it. 
This usage is very closely related to what I said before. You vary the product of action with respect to the metric. We already did that. But now you define the energy momentum tensor by dividing by this object here. It's slightly non-standard normalization in field theory, but in strength this is conventional. Then you cancel this funny factor and you have this nice object left. So this is the stress energy tensor derived from the Polykov action. As we said before, we would like this to be zero if this is to be equivalent to the Namagot action classically. So we want to impose TAB equals zero as a classical constraint. It's another way to express what I said before. Now this stress energy tensor has different morphism invariants, meaning it's conserved. And in complex coordinates, that you, if you've seen this before, this will be very evident to you. If not, we'll talk about it later. There's a current, there's a neuter current that will lead to conformal symmetry of the quantum field theory on the string worksheet. While the invariance can be translated to trace of this stress energy tensor is zero, which is easy to see here. If you trace this here, you see that it vanishes classically which in complex coordinates means that the off-diagonal component z, z bar is zero. However, there could be a quantum anomaly. These are classical invariances. They could be anomaly, and it turns out to be easy to preserve diffeomorphism and Poincaré invariance from the classical string theory and the quantum string theory, but it's not as obvious to preserve the quantum while invariance. As a short uh, bonus question, is the Polkov action unique? No, we could add the word sheet Ricci scalar to it. However, this is uh, topological. It doesn't depend on the metric, doesn't contribute to the equations of motion, because it's in two dimensions it's the Euler characteristic. Now Euler didn't define the Euler characteristic like this. It follows from the gauss bonnet theorem that Euler's definition, which is more like this in topology, as we would call it today, is equivalent to this uh, geometrical definition. For example, a cube has Euler characteristic 2, because it has 8 vertices, 12 edges, and 6 faces. If you're interested in this, take a look at the definition of Euler characteristic and the gauss bonnet theorem. This leads to a whole slew of mathematics. For example, the Euler class is a natural generalization of this object uh, to vector bundles. And there's a lot of fun math here. The generalized gauss bonnet theorem, the riemann roch theorem, and the Atiyah singer index theorem. Mathematics, the index of the Dirac operator is integral, uh, integral churn class of the vector bundle times the a roof genus of the curvature. But this is not necessary to understand in detail right now. The summary is, Here's the Polkov action. It's given in terms of the embedding function from world sheet coordinates sigma and tau to space time with an index mu. There's the world sheet object gamma that appears in this action. There's a normalization that has to do with this object with units of area. The Polkov action is classically equivalent to the number go to action, which is just the area of the world sheet, if we impose that the stretch unit tensor vanishes. And this is simply because the stress energy tensor is defined as the variation with respect to the world sheet metric. And that was what we needed to impose to get back to the number goat action from the Polykov action. This action has symmetries Poincaré in d dimensions on this index. It has diff symmetry in two dimensions on these indices. And it has this, at this point, perhaps somewhat mysterious wild symmetry of rescaling of the world sheet metric. This is non-covariant quantum string theory. So in the previous video, we talked about the Polyakov action. This is uh, the embedding function x, mu, and the world sheet metric gamma ab. ab runs from 0 to 1, and mu is a d-dimensional index. So from the point of view of the world sheet, the two-dimensional theory on the world sheet that the string sweeps out in time, this is d master scalars coupled to the metric in two dimensions. The gauge invariance is the local invariances of this action. It's diffeomorphism, the coordinate transformations along the string world sheet, and the while scaling of the world sheet metric, gamma. Together, these are three invariances, two uh, coordinate transformations and one rescaling. The Poincaré invariance uh, is, a, is not a local symmetry from the point of the world sheet. It's a global symmetry, since these are uh, scalars from the point of view of the world sheet. In this video, I will now non-covariantly quantize this action. This gets the result quickly, but we will want to use a covariant method later. To get there, we'll impose some conditions. We need to fix these three invariances. We'll impose one condition on the sigma-sigma component of the metric, and one on its determinant. We get one left. We'll split up the mu index in 0 and 1, and the rest. Take the 0 and 1, and we we'll rotate them 45 degrees. This looks like a light cone, because this is time and this is space. So this is a light cone, x plus and x minus. We'll fix the final freedom by demanding that the world sheet time is actually the light cone time x plus, not the space time time x zero. If you do this, then the Hamiltonian, it's the general time translations, and it turns out then to be the minus component 
this component of the momentum. You can then compute the mass in string units. Remember, this is units of area squared. So this is dimensionless number. Because the metric now becomes off diagonal, you get this. When you compute m squared equal to minus p squared, we get the usual contribution from these transverse directions. So just to have something to keep in mind, we know that in the superstring, this will be d will be 10. So this will be 2 directions, and this will be 8 directions. So we'll have 8 transverse directions labeled by an index i. Here is just a quick sketch, so I'm just going to set the length of the string to be some convenient value. And then the Hamiltonian in light cone gauge looks like this. So this is integrated over the length of an open string. So now in light cone gauge, we see that we don't have d scalars anymore. We have only the transverse scalars. So in 10 dimensions, this will be 8 scalars, x. We have the canonical momentum, which is d tau x. And we have the d sigma x. In uh, Susskind's video about string theory, he explains an open string composed of tiny little particles along the string. Then this would be the kinetic energy of those particles together. And this would be the Hooke's law energy if give you this tension that the string has. Now if you take the usual Hamiltonian equations of motion, from this, you get the wave equation. So this is a world sheet equation of motion for these d minus 2 free massless scalars. This can be solved explicitly. Here's the solution for an open string. So we have open string boundary conditions. I put Neumann boundary conditions here and here. It's also interesting to put Dirichlet, but we'll do that later. Now this p here is the total canonical momentum, so we can call that the center of mass momentum. The average x is the center of mass location, and these are the Fourier modes. So we call those the non-zero modes, and we call the x and the p terms the zero modes. To quantize this, we impose equal time commutators, just like we would in quantum field theory. So xp is minus i. You might recognize this better if you put h bar back, but we're going to keep it equal to 1. We always set the x and momentum commutator equal to something at equal time. And on the previous slide, we had these x and p modes, and we had this alpha here. Those are our Fourier coefficients. So for the modes, we get these commutation relations. This looks pretty standard. But notice that the only non-trivial commutation relation is if they're in the same direction. For the oscillators, there's only a non-trivial commutation if the mode number is opposite here and here. So if this is positive and this is negative. We also see that the number here also occurs in the actual commutator. This is unlike the usual harmonic oscillator oscillators. If you want to compare to that, you can rescale them such that you do get the usual commutation relation. But uh, the reason this m appears here is because we have a tau derivative here. So it's inescapable that there'll be a, some kind of m asymmetry between these two pieces. And therefore, you'll always get something here, even if you try to rescale your Fourier coefficients. Given this, our solution of the wave equation, we plug it back into the Hamiltonian. And we get first this center of mass energy. Notice this looks a lot like the non-relativistic energy, p squared over 2m, but here m is replaced by the light cone plus direction momentum. This is also explained intuitively in Susskind's uh, lectures, where he talks about this as the infinite momentum frame, another name for the light cone frame, in which you argue that if you boost very fast, time gets dilated a lot, and then the string actually looks non-relativistic in this strange kind of frame. When we later work current, we will not need to make this kind of argument. Our results will be true in any frame. Here we see what we get from the non-zero modes. We get a number operator. Remember, this was like an A dagger. This is like an A. So this is like a counting operator that counts how many oscillators you have in a certain state. We act with your Hamiltonian. So the energy is determined by how many oscillators you have in the state just like for a harmonic oscillator, there's also the possibility of an ordering constant. There's an ambiguity when you write this down, how you write the ordering of your quantum operators that don't commute. So we have to fix this somehow. But first, notice that the mass now, we have the same formula we had before, m squared is minus p squared in string units, but p minus is our Hamiltonian. So plugging in this whole expression here, we get a very simple result. The mass of the string, the mass energy, if you will, is given by the level plus the normal ordering constant. So how do we compute this constant? We said this is like harmonic oscillator. We have to think about ordering these oscillators. Typical expression for energy of the harmonic oscillator, ground state energy. And that's completely analogous. In fact, it's the same kind of thing as this capital A here. Now we have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, one for each Fourier mode. And so we have an infinite number of these possible frequency contributions. The frequency runs from 1 to infinity. We have transverse number of these, d minus 2, because we had an i here. And there was a half from the half of the ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator. Now, probably most of you who watch this video already know that the infinite sum here looks very, very divergent. It's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on. But you can just look up this Wikipedia page. It explains to you that this is an old result in mathematics, probably first considered by Euler, that replaces this infinite sum by minus 1 12th in a well-defined way. Pochinski gives a nice argument why this regularization is not arbitrary. The infinite constant has to be cancelled to preserve the invariances. For d greater than 2, we see that this whole thing is negative because of this minus sign here. 
So this is a negative Casimir zero point energy. And this will be important. We'll see that to get some massless state here, we have to actually put some oscillator to cancel this negative zero point Casimir energy. So let's start with the first state where we haven't canceled it. We have no oscillators. That means you have a negative energy. This state is a scalar. It has no space-time index i. So it's called a tachyon. A tachyon is something that travels faster than the speed of light. Or more physically, it has a negative potential. The mass is, of course, the second derivative of the scalar potential. So having a negative mass means being unstable like this. This is a quote from Polchinski. It's a complicated question whether the bosonic string has any stable vacuum. And the answer is not known. I think it's fair to say that this is a difficult question, but there's certainly a lot of progress since Polchinski's book. For example, this paper discusses simple solutions for this. In the superstring, however, the tachyon has eigenvalue minus one of this operator, and it turns out to be natural in superstring theory, also for other reasons, to impose this GSO projection for things that have eigenvalue minus one of this operator are simply projected out. So the tachyon will not be part of the spectrum of superstring theory. The second state we could consider for the open string, this is actually sort of a jargon, one oscillator means one oscillator in each direction labeled by i. So I call this one oscillator, but of course really it's eight oscillators in 10 dimensions because these are transverse indices d minus two. I put in the uh, creation operator alpha minus one, acting on a state that has a center mass momentum k. The mass squared of this state, the m squared is minus p squared, one for the level. Remember we had n plus a here for the mass energy. We see that this is actually 26 minus d, and we expect a massless vector would have d minus two states in d dimensions. So if we wanted this to be massless, this should better be zero, in which case d would have to be 26. And the way to say this is that the stabilizer group or the little group of the Lorentz group in d dimensions is SOD minus 2. So in d equals 10, it will be SO8. In d equals 26, it will be SO24. Sometimes this is stated as saying that bosonic string is only consistent in 26 space time dimensions. This is a little dangerous statement. A little better to say quantization of bosonic string theory only preserves d dimensional Lorentz symmetry in d equals 26. And I'll come back to later what the important distinction is between these two statements. Now, what kind of state is this? I claim it's a photon. It has a space-time vector index. Now, we're not working covariantly, so it only has the transverse directions. I claim that in covariant quantization, it will be a mu index. If you multiply it by a constant matrix representing the gauge group, it will also be able to represent a gluon. But for now, let's just think about the state here. It looks like this. So I just plug in these numbers here on the right. You get this simple rotating open string. For closed strings, solve the wave equation. For closed strings, I get something very similar to the open string, except I get left movers and right movers that I denote by alpha tilde. A massless state here, by the same logic as before, will need to have an oscillator. Now we'll have an oscillator in each of the left and the right movers. So this is a, from the space-time point of view, this is an object that has two space-time vector indices. So it has two indices, meaning there are d minus two squared states in d dimensions by the previous argument. This is a massless tensor then. It breaks up as a symmetric plus anti-symmetric plus trace. So for example, in four dimensions, we're not directly working in four dimensions, but because you might be more used to the counting there, uh, d minus two in four dimensions would be two. Two squared is four. Four is two plus one plus one. So in, in four dimensions, you would have two symmetric polarizations, one anti-symmetric and one trace. A symmetric two tensor that has two polarizations will be a graviton. So the graviton is described by the symmetric part of this massless state of closed strings. Well, the other two objects are the anti-symmetric and the trace. Right now, they look like some kind of extra junk. We'll get back to them later. So this is what a closed string oscillates like in this symmetric state, the graviton. Here's the trace, just for fun. You can figure out yourself how to get this, this uh, animation. For later, it's interesting that the uh, additional gauge invariance in the closed string of shifting the origin around the closed string can be fixed by setting the operator p, which generates translations along the closed string, to zero. This imposes that the left and right movers should have the same level. That's why I didn't consider just putting in a left mover. You might have thought that should be a natural thing to do, but I actually have to put an equal number of left and right movers into my state. To summarize, quantum strings in light cone gauge, you go to these coordinates, light cone coordinates, that allows you to fix these three conditions using the standard method from the Polyakov action and get this Hamiltonian. So now you have d minus two massless scalars. The Hamiltonian equation of motion is a wave equation, can be easily solved given some boundary conditions, for example, for an open string or for a closed string with periodic. You impose canonical quantization conditions at equal time. You get these mode relations. And then you can take these oscillators that look like harmonic oscillators. We have an infinite number of them indexed by an index m. The negative ones will be the creation operators. Positive ones will be the annihilation operators. So I put in my first creation operator and I act on a state that has no oscillator, but k 
center mass momentum. I get a photon with an additional matrix in front. I get a gluon. And I get a graviton by taking the symmetric part of this closed string state. This looks like something that rotates. This looks like how a ring of test particles will be affected by gravitational waves. So it should give you this feeling of a graviton state. And we'll get back to this later. Non-covariantly, we have fixed the world sheet metric. We fix space on to be flat. The symmetries are not manifest. This is not really convenient in many respects. We'll do covariant quantization. It's in Polchinski chapter 3 to 5. It is more work, but it's worth it. It sheds light on a lot of other things you might have learned. It's a very nice structure.